And today I want to address specifically, the topic is understanding the purpose of our authority as believers. If you're a believer, there's an authority God has given you. Why did he give you that authority? What is it for? Amen. And I want us to turn to our Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28 and read verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Amen. 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 Before I go, let me acknowledge Pastor Rex in our midst. Pastor Rex, I will see Calvary Baptist Church. Amen. I give a clap for the Lord for him. He's, he's been with us for a while, and uh, uh, he's, he's a faithful brother. Amen. When you go to Ghana, there's a street in Accra called N1. His, his church is right off N1. Amen. The passage we read is what is popularly popular called the Great Commission, where Jesus tells us to go and preach the gospel, make disciples, amen, and to teach people all that he has taught us. But when you look at verse 18, before Jesus told us to go in verse 19, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So go, Amen. All authority is given me, to me, so go. I believe this implies that he has authority and he's telling us to go, so in essence, he's giving us the authority to go. Do you agree with me? It's like I give you my car key and I say, look, this car belongs to me, drive it. It means, because it belongs to me, I have authority to give it to you. If I don't say I'm authorizing you to drive it, once I say drive it, you take it and you do it, I'm, I have, I'll give you the permission, Amen. If my wife meets you and says, why are you driving my husband's car? You say, he gave me authority. Are you following me? So, I want to say this. And listen very carefully. The Great Commission is not just a command. It is also giving us authority to go do something. Are you with me? So, the Great Commission really gives us authority as believers. It's a command, but it also gives us authority to go do something. And if, if, if you go to the book of Acts, chapter 1, he says the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Amen. When we talk about authority the first time, when I said difference between authority and power, I told you that when God gives you authority or any organization gives you authority, you will be given power to enforce the authority. So that's the Great Commission gives us authority to go do something. But then in the book of Acts, at Pentecost, we're given the power to do what we have been given authority to do. Amen. So Pentecost was about power. The Great Commission is about authority. Why do we need authority to carry out the Great Commission? Because, let me say this, we were supposed to go and make disciples, make disciples, not just make converts, hallelujah, but to make disciples. And if you look at the process, <clears throat> making a disciple is not just convincing someone who maybe is misguided and is a Redskins fan, to become an arrest, I mean, it's misguided. Hey, why did I say it? I'm finished. They are going to trouble me. <laughs> Who is misguided? It's a Dallas Cowboys fan. <laughs> to become a Red Kings fan. Do you get that? It's not just trying to convince them to stop following Dallas and to just support the Red Kings. Are you getting me? It's more than that. In fact, the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Please read it for me. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, shall shine on them. Amen. 
Amen. Which means those in the world who don't know Christ, the issue is not they don't have information. It's not a mental thing. The God of this world, the devil, has blinded them. Amen. So they cannot understand the gospel. Or they cannot hear it so that they cannot receive Christ. So there is a spiritual element in it. The devil has done something to them. So there are people walking around dressed, very logical, very nice people who make a lot of sense. That's the devil has done something to them. When you go to share the gospel with them, you're not just trying to convince them in their mind. You are actually trying to take away that blindness. You are trying to take away the darkness that the devil has put over them. So that the light of Christ can penetrate. So my brother and sister, it's a spiritual exercise. It is a spiritual miracle. When you preach to someone, they say, ah, I get it. I want to receive Christ. For you to be able to do it successfully, it's going to take power and authority from someone who has all authority in heaven. And that's why Jesus said, you need my authority and power to go out and do this. And he has given it to us when he declared it in Matthew 28. Hallelujah. Now, there's a second part of it. It's not just about converting people, but discipline is, is linked to the word discipline. So, what is discipline? Being able to conform to a certain way of life. When the devil blinds them, he messes up. He messes them up. Do you get it? He messes up their way of thinking, their character, the way they do things, everything. He messes them up. So, when the person is converted... We will also teach them the word, and the word will transform them. Theologians call it sanctification, but I, I, I like to use the word transformation. That is where somebody who had a certain lifestyle, a character that you can't trust, all of a sudden they hear the gospel, and then they begin to change. I remember many years ago, I met a friend of mine. We were, when we were little, we lived in the same neighborhood. Now, I've not seen him for years. And I went to a, a Christian event in Accra, and I met him. I said, Charlie, is this you? He said, oh. It's me, oh, I am now a Christian. I received the Lord. Then we were talking. I said, hey, as for you, God has done some miracle. Oh. Even the way you talk is different. Said, Look at who is talking. You too. You know? So the gospel also transforms. Amen. And makes you different. So not only are you going to be, become, you know, when somebody discipled, not only are they converted, but transformation takes place. And that takes the power of God. That is why we need authority to do this. Now, one thing I want you to note here also, Jesus said to make disciples of all nations, of all nations, which means he also breaks boundaries. You know, many of us, we have cultural limitations. I'm from Africa, so I want to fellowship with Africans. We are the African. We do our things the African way. He said, look, when, when you come to me, I'm going to send you to all nations. Amen. So my brother and my sister, the Great Commission is meant to remove a limitation from your life too. Uh, some of you, you can't talk to anybody unless they are like you. They are from your country. They are from your tribe. May God save us from that. Hallelujah. That is the mistake the church made in the first century. Because they were natives of Jerusalem, all from Judea. They thought that, oh, this gospel thing Jesus has brought is meant for Judea. But Jesus said, you've got to get out of here. And you have to set persecution to drive them out, to go to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Hallelujah. So the power of Christ, the authority he gives us, is to help us to break those limitations so that we can go beyond. Because the issue of discipling is a miracle. We take the power of God to actually... Make people, unblind people, take away darkness from their lives so they can receive the word of God. Amen. And after they have received it, it also brings transformation in their lives. This is what the gospel is about. And this is the mandate Christ has given us. What he's given us authority to do. That is his purpose for the church. Amen. And guess who the church is? It's you and I. Amen. Before I go on, let me say this. Let me say this. Um... So someone was asked me, Pastor, if Christ has given me the authority and the power, how come last time I went to witness to someone, they told, me, they told me to get off their face? Has it happened to anybody? The more you, pray, you preach to the person, the worse they become. You get what I'm saying? So you have given up witnessing. You have given up evangelism. Because this thing, you don't think it works. Let me tell you one thing. Let's go to the book of John chapter 4. 
Please read 36 to 38 for me. And if you are that person, you are discouraged, you don't think evangelism works because you came to Christ, you heard about witnessing, and you went and witnessed to everybody. And they said, oh, get out of my face. And you said, I'm going to stop. Listen to this very carefully and align this in your Bible because the Bible belongs to you. Mm-hmm. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Mm -hmm. For in this the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Amen. Amen. So Jesus is saying here in a sense that there are two parts to evangelism. There is a sowing part and there is a reaping part. Some people you go, you are going to sow a seed. Amen. And somebody will harvest in the future. So when you witness to someone and they get agitated and angry with you, you have sown a seed. Because they have reacted to the word. That way, you pray for it. It will germinate. It will grow. One day, they will go to church somewhere. Somebody will come for it to receive Christ. And they go. And the pastor, like me, will stand there and say, man, the word was powerful. You don't know that you sowed. I was only harvesting what you have sown. Amen. So there are some you will go one day and you witness to them. My brother, Jesus loves you. Oh, thank you. I thank you. Jesus loves me. And then you feel like, wow, my anointing is somebody sowed. You are only reaping. Do you get it? But there are some you also sow and somebody else will reap. I hope you get me. When I came to Christ, when I came to Christ, I did not pray for God to make me rich. I don't pray for God to. The first thing I prayed, I saw the Philippian jailer in the book of Acts. What was he told? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved in your household. I took that scripture to God and I said, God, you said if I'm saved, you save me and my household. So I want you to save my mother, I want you to save my father, I want you to save my siblings. I prayed that prayer for a long time. The more I took my brother and I prayed the gospel to them, the worse some of them got. Pastor Maxwell has shared some of the stories with you. And my sister Georgina. I'll take Georgina to church every day, Calvary. Pastor Kofi, and when I take her, she said she won't go to the Philippines. I said, why? She said, when I stand there, people were looking at me because my voice is so bad. <laughs> That's somebody's excuse for not going to church. And, and then they'll go to the club on Saturday night, expecting I'll be angry with them. They will sleep late. By the time they get up, when I'm waiting to take them to church, I drag them to church. And it was like the work was in vain. But one day, one day, one day, hallelujah, they give their lives to Christ. One of my younger brothers who passed away, my sister was sharing his testimony. What they did to me, he also did to them. Because he went to stay with them. The more they took him to check, the worse he got. The one day there was a crusade in a crowd, they took him there. And you have to control the boy because if you leave him right now, he will go and cause trouble somewhere. So they were watching him. When the crusade, listen to the when they were watching him. Sit down, sit down. My sister said he looked and the boy was gone. He said, oh, not this boy, not at this crusade. He looked on the stage, people who had been healed were going to testify, and the, brother, the boy was standing there. He said, oh my God, this boy is going to embarrass me. He came to his tent, he took the mic, and he said, many of you here came for the healing of your body, but I came for the healing of my soul. I want to give my life to Christ. I said, that boy is up to something. That boy is up to something. So they led him, he said a sinner's prayer, and that was it transformed, changed forever, until he went home to be with the Lord. And he was a deacon in his church. Hallelujah. So you sow, and some will reap. So don't get discouraged. Because that is the purpose of the authority Christ gave to us. For us to go and to preach the gospel to the world and to make disciples. And that's one of the greatest things. Seeing people transformed. Amen. Seeing people transformed. One of our members, I used to be in a cell with her. She brought a, a, a nephew. And we put a person on our awkward list. We prayed for the person. She witnessed to the person. Then the person came to the church. The young man, he's had his rasta hair on, came and stood there. I'm sure the auntie would say, oh, no, not again. We gave the altar call. He came forward. Praise God. I'm talking about the transforming power of the word. He came forward. The seed has been sown already. Amen. Prayer has gone forth to water the seed. The young man came from where he received Christ. Do you know when he got, got home, 
His wife told him to move out. Because what he used to do, he, doesn't, he didn't do it anymore. The drinking, the smoking, he stopped suddenly. And I asked the wife, why are you worried? I said, Pastor, things don't just work that way. These things, they take time to go. How can you go to church, come home and say you stop all of us? And I'm watching and he's not doing it. That is the power of the gospel. And you know what? That power, that authority has been given to us to send that word out, to transform the world. Hallelujah. And that is the purpose of our authority in Christ as a church and as believers. Let me tell you this. God will not send angels to change the world. Are you hearing me? If you are praying for your loved ones, one day they'll be lying down, then the light will come into the room, and an angel will come with a sword and say, unless thou givest thy life to Christ, thou shalt. And then you go, and then it's not going to happen. Let me take you to the Bible. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. And look at a few verses there. This is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian Enoch. Please read from verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 30. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Why didn't the angel go himself? He says an angel came to Philip. Angels probably don't need a chariot, they don't need a horse, they don't need an Uber to go, right? So why doesn't the angel go and meet the Ethiopian Enoch? But he tells Philip, Philip, go and meet him. Because the authority has been given to us. Amen. At the church. So you are the Philip today. I am the Philip. No angel will do it for us. We are going to skip to verse 29. It, says, it goes on to say that when he went, as the angel said, he saw uh, uh, an Ethiopian Enoch, amen, who was in a chariot, sitting in the chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then verse 29, this is what he says. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Okay. So the Holy Spirit then comes to, to, to Philip and says, go and overtake this chariot. Holy Spirit, you are the Spirit. You can move faster than me. So why did the Holy Spirit go and then speak to the spirit of the man and preach the gospel to him? He was reading the book of Isaiah. He didn't understand it. Don't you think it's the Holy Spirit who teaches us all things? Anybody here knows the scripture more than the Holy Spirit? Philip knows the scripture more than the Holy Spirit? No. But the Holy Spirit came and told Philip, Philip, I can speak, but you go and tell him. Why? Because the job of the Holy Spirit is to convict, not to preach the gospel. Amen. So I preach the gospel. Philip preaches the gospel. You preach the gospel. Then the Holy Spirit will convict. There are many of us. We are friends, relatives who are in sin. The Holy Spirit is waiting to convict them. But somebody must preach the word to them. Must tell them the word. So the Holy Spirit will convict them. And then they will come and receive Christ. But if we have our mouth shut. And we say it is not my business. This one is doomed for hell. I don't want to bother them. They love the world too much. My brother and sister, some years ago, you also loved the world. Anybody here has a testimony like that? What they are doing, I was doing it, you were doing it too. Amen. But somebody preached the gospel to you. So unless we preach, the Holy Spirit cannot convict. Amen. And then Philip went ahead, explained it to him, and then the man said, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he was baptized and he received Christ as his Lord and Savior. Amen. So, brother, my sister, the Holy Spirit is waiting for us. It is a job that has been given to us as believers to do. And God will not send angels. Amen. And the Holy Spirit will also not do it for us. And the Lord will not do it for us. Let's go to the following chapter, Acts chapter 9. This is the story of Saul when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Please read from verse 6. After the encounter with Jesus, verse 6, what are they saying? Acts chapter 9, verse 6. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Why? Then Jesus said, Oh, who knows our Jesus more than him? Who knows the gospel more than Jesus? 
But Jesus met him. He was trembling. He said, go to the city and you, ma- you will be told what to do. Amen. Please go on to verse 10. Verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Amen. Amen. So the same Jesus goes, tells Saul, go and wait. Amen. Go and wait. Then he goes back to Ananias and tells Ananias, Saul is waiting for you, so go and talk to him. Go and pray for him. Because it's not the job of Jesus. He has died on the cross already for our sins. Now the mandate to carry the gospel has been given to the church. So he has to find somebody in the church called Ananias. Ananias, Ananias, now it's your turn to go and do it. Like how he did it when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Hey, remove the stone. Then he speaks, Lazarus, come forth. Then he tells them, go and remove the cloth from him. And the mandate of the church is to share the gospel. So Jesus will not do it for us. So if you're expecting that sinner brother or sister of yours, the person you've been praying for, for Jesus to come one day and then tell him, I am Jesus, will you believe in me? It ain't happening. But that is again the law of the word of God. Hallelujah. Because he has given the mandate to us already. And look at verse 17. Please read verse 17 for me. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Ananias went, laid hands on him. He received his sight, so he was healed. Amen. And the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, whose hands is more powerful than Jesus? The one in Jesus just go and lay his hands on him so that he received his sight. You know, Jesus could have done it, but he has given that power, that authority to the church. Amen. So Ananias had to go and do it. And there are some of you, Jesus is moving you. Pray for their sake. Pray for someone who has a need. He said, Lord, you pray yourself. Look, when you go through scripture, when Jesus asked us to pray about evangelism, he said, pray to the Lord of harvest that he will send more laborers into the field. He didn't say pray to God that God will convert people. He needs laborers. And where are the laborers? You are sitting right here, and I'm standing here. Oh, is somebody understanding me? We have been given the power and authority to do it. You know, one of the the greatest frustrations in his life is to give someone authority to do something, and it will come back to you to go and do it yourself. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Aha. I form a committee to do a job. Then you come back to me, Pastor, can you do this for us? Why do I have a committee? (laughs) Amen? (laughs) <laughs> and many of us, you know that's what we do to God? Christ has died. He has saved us, given us the power. Go ye into the world and make disciples. So I'm empowering you to go relieve the blindness and the darkness from people and, to, and by the word that I've given you, teach them to transform their lives. And every time, oh Jesus, do it. Do it. So now you are delegating back to Jesus what is delegated to you. That's very naughty. Amen. It's good that he's a patient God. Amen. Let's look at the case of Moses. When you go to Exodus 14, and you look at verse 10, it's a very interesting story. Sometimes we get on Moses' case about this. Uh, he, had let it, God, he met God the first time, and God said, what is in your hand? He said, the rod. And God said, you know what? Cast the rod down. It became a snake. God said, take it up by the tail. He took it, and it became a rod again. When he went to Egypt, the first time he challenged Pharaoh, Pharaoh's magicians also had their rods turned into snakes, and that snake of of Moses swallowed their snakes. Amen. And by that rod, wherever he stretched it on the waters, it became blood. He stretched it upon the land. Something came upon them. He used it for many miracles. Now you have left Egypt, you are going, and you come to the Red Sea. Please read, read, read it for me. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptian marched 
the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Go to verse 13. Verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. 15, 14. 14. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. In verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. 16. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Hallelujah. I like the prayer Moses prayed from verse 13, verses 13 and 14. A wonderful prayer. Yes, stand and see the power of the Lord. This is you saying you will see the name of for the Lord will fight for you. My brother, my sister, he has delivered you already out of Egypt. He's giving the rod to Moses. So God tells him, look, stop calling on me. You stretch your hand and divide the sea because I'll give you the authority and the power to do it. And personally, when I read this, I can sense a frustration in God's voice. Because what Moses was praying was a wasted prayer. It's like God has done it already. And you are still going back to him. He's delegated a power. I've given you the rod. Use this rod to do miracles. And you go and stand there and the Lord will show. Look, this one, don't come to me. Oh. Do it yourself. And there are people in the world who need Christ today. It's like we are trying to tell Christ to do the conversion for us. When he's given us the power to bring the transformation. Ah, is somebody getting some understanding here? Somebody get some understanding here. And I believe it, it gets very frustrating for God sometimes when we keep coming to him to pray all these prayers. Do you know that in all the miracles Jesus did, there wasn't a time when he prayed to God except at the resurrection of Lazarus. And even then he made a statement. He says, Father, I am praying for the sake of those standing here. For their sake. But he didn't, all he needed to do was command Lazarus to come out because he knew in his mouth there was power to speak. Are you hearing me? So if God has given us authority and power, please, let us not keep going back to him, expecting him to do what he has delegated and empowered us to do. Amen. Amen. Let us go back to Mark chapter 16. You see, the Great Commission, the one we read the first time, is in the book of Matthew. But let's look at the Mark, Mark version of the Great Commission. And... Um, We'll read from verse 15. Mark 16 from verse 15. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 20. Mm -hmm. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mm -hmm. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Mm -hmm. They will speak with new tongues. Mm -hmm. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Okay. So let me just take you through this carefully. He goes and says, go into the world and preach the gospel. And those who believe, these signs will follow them. Amen. In my name, they will cast out demons. What is casting out demons? It means that what I said before, there are demons of this world who are blinded. Amen. The unbelievers. So they said when we preach the gospel to them, these demons will set them free. The young man I talked about who came here, received Christ, and went back and didn't do the things he was doing, is because some demons were taken out of him. He did not jump and roll about and you know, have all kinds of confusion here. There are times when the Holy Spirit will do that, but there are times when he does it quietly. Amen. Because he is powerful. So these times will follow them, not just a few of them. Amen. And then he, he goes on to say that in the Catholic, you know, they will speak with new tongues. This one is a whole different subject. They are, it says here, this time will follow us. I don't know why Christians don't want to speak in tongues. Tongues is a prayer language. Amen. So we need to use tongues also to pray, to bring people into the kingdom. In fact, Paul said that tongues is a sign to the world. Amen. We need to use tongues to, to, to pray to the Lord so that people can understand. But then look at verse 18. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly, anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. 
Powerful, isn't it? Who is the serpent? It's the devil. In Genesis, he's called a serpent. In Revelation, he's called the great serpent. And then he matures to become a dragon. In Genesis, in Revelation 12. Amen. So when the scripture talks about that, so in essence, we will, take, we will pick up the devil and he cannot hurt us. Because you see, this whole thing about evangelism is about going into the kingdom of the devil to liberate people who he has in captive, who is held in captivity. And he does not like it. So if you are afraid of the devil, you cannot do evangelism. Amen. Because sometimes he will show you things that he can do. But Jesus has given you the power and the authority already. So the devil cannot hurt you. If I tell people that if the devil could kill me, you have killed me already. Because of some of you here. Some of you, you are, they require you in your villages to carry idols. And you came here and Pastor Deminta is teaching you all this word. And God, that idol does not have anybody to carry it. If they had, but I'm not afraid to do it. Hallelujah. So if you, are, you can't witness to somebody because you think they are homosexual, you think they are too liberal, you think that they are afraid of the devil. That is the, they are the people who need the word more. Amen. And that's where it's powerful, it's transforming. So he said that the devil, you can take him on and he cannot do anything to you. And he said even if you drink something deadly, you know, I'm not telling you to go and drink poison no <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't tell you to go and drink poison. But you see, if the devil had his way, he would poison you. Because you are a threat to him. And let me tell you, why will God preserve you? Because he has a mandate for you. He has delegated something to you. Look, I believe with all my heart that every extra hour I live, every day I live, God preserves me because he has a mandate for me to do in terms of discipling people. Because that is the mandate that he has given me. And until that mandate is finished. See, God doesn't look at me and, and give me another day because of me, because of somebody who needs me. Amen. That he wants to use me. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And he's given us the mandate to do that way. Christ has died already. But for people to come to his salvation and knowledge, the word must go forth. And that is where God needs us. Amen. So we need to understand that this whole empowerment or authority that God has given us is a package. But the bottom line is that it is for making sure that the world will come to him. Hallelujah. That the world will come to him. So he will preserve us. He will protect us so that we will make disciples for him. Amen. This whole servant of God, you know, uh, these days, you know, when you go to prayer meeting, the way we pray, it's like we have become so selfish and self-centered. We hardly ever pray for souls. We hardly ever pray for the world. We are praying for our own needs. But you know something? Even if God is going to make me wealthy, it is because of the kingdom. Because he wants to bring people into the kingdom. Hallelujah. And if God were to give me a million dollars today, I'll make sure I use it for the kingdom. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. That is the purpose. As a church, I believe we are blessed because God knows that we have a heart for souls and we want to win people out there for him. So he knows he can trust us. When we get the money, we are not just going to buy private jets and, and make ourselves and make a name for ourselves. And some of them, the robes they wear, even I don't know how they can stand. So that you see that we are who we are. What I was watching a, a, a TV program, somebody preaching, and the man was wearing a robe behind the robe was really bishop. Not everybody knows you are bishop. Do you have to write it on your back? You know, we are so much into ourselves. The main purpose why God gave us the power, the authority, and all that we have is lost. And sometimes we compete. I don't know if this happens in other African countries, but in Ghana, they say this person is this person are more powerful than this one. This person are more powerful. Than, these days they are competing with cars. This one says I have 20. This one says I have 30. And then this buy, one buys this car. This one tries to buy a better one. Well, what is this? In the meantime, souls are perishing. So we need to reorientate ourselves to know that the power, authority, the blessings that we have, we are blessed so that we can be a blessing. And the greatest blessing we can give to anybody is to lead them to Christ. That should be our purpose in life. If you want to succeed, Amen. Come on, you can give the right clap offering for that. It's okay to pray to the Lord to be successful financially, everything. But you want to pray, so you show his glory. So people will come and tell you, how did you do it? And you tell them that, look, it is God who blessed me, so give your life to him. And that will bring a transformation into their lives. I believe we should be blessed as believers. Yes. So we don't go to non-believers begging them for, I'm, I'm tired of those days when they say, if you're a Christian, you should be poor. And they always want this one to go and beg the unbelievers. Let them come to us. They will tell them, you know, the back to school case we do. Amen. 
Every one of them, we put a gospel message in it. The gospel of Christ. And I call one principal, I say, is it okay? He say, hey, you are giving somebody a gift. They don't like it, they should return it to you. Yes. Best it is, may Lord, that we can't preach the gospel in the school. But if I'm giving you a gift, because I can afford to do it, we can buy that thing and we have the money to buy it and give it to them. We put a gospel in and they have to take it whether they like it or not. Amen. That is why we have to be successful. But our goal in our success is that we we'll bring glory to God. I pray daily for, for the people in this church that you will succeed in everything that you do. Amen. It is my prayer that somebody comes here, even if they are down there, by the time they leave here. One brother came here this week, was it last week or this week, and testified to me. He said, Pastor, when we came here, we were there. Now we are here. I said, praise God. Praise God. That's what we want to do. But all of it is not so that we can buy bigger cars and bigger houses, but that we will make disciples of the world. Hallelujah. The person who would not listen to you when you are poor, when you go to them and you will drive a nice car, then they will listen to you. Am I right? Hallelujah. Amen. So may God bless you and make you great. <laughs> but the purpose should be that we will propagate the gospel. Let's read one more scripture and then we will take the Lord's Supper. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. If you forget everything I said today, please don't forget this scripture. Second Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then... We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Amen. Hallelujah. All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus, and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Are you reconciled to God? If you are saved, you are born again, you are reconciled to God. I was lost in sin, amen, separated from God, but by the death of Christ, I was reconciled to God. Why was I reconciled to God? So that God would give me the ministry of reconciliation. So I'm reconciled to him. He sends me out to go and bring others so they will be reconciled to him. So my brother and my sister, the purpose of your salvation is not just to go to heaven. Otherwise, the day you accepted Christ, the Lord will have called you home. And we'll have a nice funeral for you. And then we we'll send you off. But he left the church here on earth. So that as we are reconciled to Christ, we will be the vessels through whom the world will also be reconciled to Christ. Amen. Angels will not do it. Jesus will not do it. The Holy Spirit will not do it. Are you hearing me? And he calls us ambassadors, representing the kingdom here on earth. Amen. So that we will reconcile the world to Christ. But that is why Christ died and shed his blood. It cost God a lot for this reconciliation to take place. And God's problem is that the reconciliation has taken place. His son has died. The nature of God has been affected because God, the son, became flesh. And as he sees in heaven, there are scars there. Where this blood came from, that body was broken. What was the purpose? So the world, the world will be reconciled to God. He wants a reconciliation. The world will be reconciled to him. But those who are reconciled, he's sending us to go and bring the world to be reconciled to him. He's sent us as ambassadors. And we are ambassadors on earth. Can you, can you imagine an ambassador of a country coming here? All that he does is ride a diplomatic car and, and you know, cruise the city. So he's almost a diplomat man and then dress and then go to diplomatic dinners. He does not go to be an advocate for his nation. That is how some of us are. We are trying to enjoy the blessings of God as, as, as uh, the immunity that the ambassadorial position comes of. You try to drive about speed. When they give you a parking ticket, you throw it away. But you are not doing your job. I am not doing my job. Are you getting me? A real ambassador carries out the mandate his nation has given to him. You see someone, they come to find him. But a nation will tell you, look, we want to export more of our cocoa to, to America. So go and advocate for us. So they are lobbying people, companies in America, to export more cocoa from wherever they come from. I hope you get me. That is what good diplomats do. And God says, be as ambassadors. And he makes it clear in this scripture. The purpose is that we will bring reconciliation between him and the world that is lost. That is our purpose. And yes, it has changed. 
and all kinds of priorities. And I was telling them this morning, you know, you go to church sometimes, you sit there, powerful word is preached, but altar call, no. We, we, we spend more time sowing seeds than we do saving souls. You want me to repeat that? Do you want me to repeat that? Someone came and told me once, Pastor, this pastor, oh, he has fewer people than you. He raised 100,000. Hey, if you do it, you can say, hey, let him keep the money. I'll keep the souls. Amen. Amen. It's about souls. That is why Christ came to die. It's about souls. And all the blessings that we have in Christ, the purpose is that the world will see the glory of God in our lives. And we have to attract them to Christ also. That is why he gives us all of these blessings, these spiritual gifts, these material blessings. Amen. Amen. So that, you see, the world, he says that God looks on the inside, that man looks on the outside. Right? So the world doesn't see what is in you, but they see your character, your lifestyle. They see whatever. Most people in the world, if you are suffering and you invite them to come to church, they won't come. So God says, I'll bless you. Amen. So that they will see and they will follow you to him. Amen. And it's my prayer that we will catch this. That is why we were saved. That is why we are blessed. That is why we have been given authority and power that will bring the, the souls into the kingdom. Pentecost, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. Yes. But then when it comes to you, you are going to lock yourself into a room and pray in tongues for 24 hours a day. He said that you will be witnesses. Go there. Invite people to come to church. Invite people to come to Christ. Amen. And as I said, some of them you are sowing. They will reject you, but they will come later. Hallelujah. Now, I'll share them a testimony this, this, this morning. One time I went to Ghana and I went to a shop owned by my brother. And when I got in there, a young man said, hey, is this you? I'm like, who is this? And he came and hugged me. I was so excited. You are the one who led me to Christ. I said, me? I don't remember. You know, he was a pastor at the time. I don't remember. So he sat me down and shared his testimony with me. He was a schoolmate of my younger brother. He said one day he came to my house with, with my brother and we were talking. And there was a man from his hometown who was very powerful in the nation. I mentioned his name. Some of you are old enough to know him. Very powerful man. But the man was, um, belonged to Odd Fellows, one of these uh, secret societies. Freemasons, Freemasons. So his goal was that he would join the Freemasons so he become as powerful as that man. And when he said, I told him, young man, let me tell you something. It will make you powerful. By the end of your life, you will suffer before you die. I just told him that, casually. And he said that when that man was dying, that man suffered, just like I said. But you know what? It made him angry. That who am I to say this about this great man and for him to see it manifest? So that even convinced him more. Like I'm saying, sometimes people react negatively to the word because of how the Holy Spirit is true with the word in their lives. But he did something very funny. He told me that he didn't understand why. He decided to marry a girl who is a Christian. And some of you sisters too. Any unbeliever, then you marry them. And the girl married him. But he said when he married the girl, he decided to, to fight the girl and the church she was going to. You go to prayer meeting, he will come and pull you, come home. Huh. And you want to pray, he will disturb you. That's when he will turn up his music. He said, Pastor, I tortured the young lady. Then one day she went to a prayer meeting and she was late coming home, so my food was late. So I decided to go and fight the pastor. So he went to the pastor's house. I'm sitting home hungry. And my wife is in your church. And the man just was smiling at him and telling him how Jesus loves him. It got too much for him and then he wept and he started crying. And he said, I want to receive Jesus. And that was the day he gave his life to Christ. You get a picture. So what did I do all those years ago? I sowed. And that pastor harvested. So let's not give up. Let's not give up. Let's not give up. Let's not give up. Let's turn on our feet. Let's turn on our feet.